सहनावतु सहनौ बुणतु सह वीर करवाहे तेजस्वी नवदीत मस्तुमा विषावाहि ओ शांति 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 मे दट वन प्रोटेक्ट अस बोथ मे दट वन नरिश अस मे वी वर्क टुगेदर विथ ग्रेट एनर्जी एंड स्ट्रेंथ एंड विगर मे आर स्टडी बी एलुमेंट May we not unnecessarily cover with each other. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. So we are commencing again the study of the Kathu Punishad, and we left off at the second part that had studied. Two parts are there of the Kathu Punishad, and the second part is uh, fairly short. Each part has six sections. and so we are really on the very last of it and there is a sequence to the whole presentation uh so we are approaching the second or at least we are engaged in the second part and the second section of it so it's appropriate for those people joining the first time to give a review of what the kathu upanishad is all about and i might just give an overview of it so that we can get up to speed we haven't met for some time the kathu upanishad is one of the most profound upanishads and one of the most famous of all the upanishads it is said to be part of the taittiriya school of the yajur veda and there are two recensions of the yajur veda anyway uh it is around a very ancient story with nachiketas as the principal character and in a dialogue with yama the lord of death and when uh, the young boy persists in asking his father who will you give me to and then his father tells him that i'll give you to death that's a great advantage to some extent and yama gives three wishes to the nachiketa but the first wish which is let me return actually to my father because he spoke in anger let me return alive and the second is a request tell me how my good works may not be exhausted in an afterlife in other words tell me all about a postmortem condition where rewards can come to fruition and the third is the most important one and this becomes the great great theme of the upanishad because all the upanishads are to do with one theme only and that is what is our destiny what is our inherent freedom and how we can manage it and what is the meditative aspect that we can use to realize it and so that becomes the theme tell me the way to conquer being born again how can we become immortal puna mrityu how can we be a conqueror of death and so the upanishad as i mentioned consists of two chapters and each one has uh, three valleys or sections to it and we do understand also that the kathu upanishad is a little later since it has many chapters on many themes in common with the shrimad bhagavad gita there is a sequence to the themes and we can go through it and it's a logical sequence first of all the answer to the question comes about as that there are two alternative ways of behaving and acting and that if we resort to meditation then the fruit of our good works also would culminate in the answer to our difficulties and problems it 
is describing not only two choices, but a fruitful and effective and practical way. But if we decide that, find out that there is much more to moral behavior, if we want to ask that question, what is beyond the good and bad deeds, for example, or past and present, or any of the causal laws, then we have to describe what is called OM. Because OM not only describes the goal, but also describes the process. Repetition of it and understanding its meaning, meditating on it, becomes the way. So if we mention meditation on the self, and by self we mean that entity that sits within, that is an infinite invisible, not only that, but is a source of everything, then OM is the way. But then what about our practical environment, this human body, and all the senses and how we read and interpret the world? A useful analogy is provided. Same analogy is provided in the Bhagavad Gita. And so the analogy of a chariot comes about. And then the order of progression, how do we deal with that? Well, we have to deal with it in the same way that we operate any vehicle. We understand that there are external environments that we have to interact with. These are fed through the sense organs. And in the analogy, these are the horses belonging to a chariot that are normally inclined to go in different directions. We don't have that difficulty with a modern car. A modern car can go according to the direction of its owner. Even a Tesla car will have to be programmed. And then what is our possibility in doing all of these things? Our possibility is awakening, infinite possibilities. If you were to ask what is the theme of our Vedanta Center, I might say, if we had a vision, it would be infinite possibilities. There are infinite possibilities within us, but it's not easy. In fact, it's like treading on the edge of a razor. So delicately balanced is it. And it requires a razor sharp direction, a razor sharp intellect. In fact, the purification of the intellect really is the primary way. And that doesn't really describe how, do we, how we do it. So how do we make this discovery? It's a discovery. It's not something that is the end of a process. It's a discovery of something that is already inherently within us. But what we know is, it is not a discovery through the sense organs. We were having a small discussion with somebody earlier this morning, and they came across uh, an argument that they themselves use. You see, I am actually agnostic as opposed to agnostic. I'm agnostic because I believe in science. I can't believe in religion. But then I asked him, where do you get the idea that these two things are separate? Of course, if you understand religion to be a meaningless process, full of superstition and blind faith, I understand what you're saying. But is science a better option since it's a different field and science relies entirely on observational evidence, in other words, the senses. But the self cannot be discovered through the sense organs. This the Katu Upanishad also makes very clear. Why is it? It's because it's extremely subtle. But we can visualize it as being in the cave of the heart. And there's a story about an incarnation. Of course, the one that incarnates is always Vishnu in the Hindu trinity, the one that pervades everywhere. And so there's the story of the Vamana, the small dwarf. Bali becomes extremely powerful. And he rules all three kingdoms. Three kingdoms means he rules the whole of existence. Philosophically, we find this existence as three states of consciousness. Oh, and we repeat the Gayatri Mantra, the most sacred mantra, Vedic Mantra. It begins and is prefaced by Bhu Buha Swaha, indicating there are three worlds that we can identify. The familiar world of this observational evidence called the earth. And then there is that which is beyond, completely beyond our scope. 
and that it is an intermediate world in between, acknowledging that when you summarize everything in this way, you have now gone through the scope of this Om, and the inference is there's something even beyond that. What is that? So being so subtle, how will we deal with it? And the story of the dwarf, that is the Vamana, because the dwarf is also mentioned as a description of something that is very small, very subtle. The size of our thumb is how it's mentioned. Visualized for meditation purposes only. But it is that dwarf that is incarnated. A Brahmana appears, a small dwarf. And naturally, Bali is a great king. And he asks, what can I give you? And he says, you can give me as much land or as much space as I can cover in three steps. And of course, Bali laughs heartily. Well, you're a small fellow. All right, do your best. And Vamana then grows in size because Brahmana, Brahmana is actually all, for, all per, pervading. And he goes from this subtle, small size and covers everything in three steps, even using Bali's head as a stepping stone. So Vishnu is described as the one of three strides because that entity covers everything. What does it mean? It means for us that we can't say that the self is exclusively inside, exclusively a goal, is exclusively transcendent. No, there's an imminence to it. Not only that, but we come to a conclusion that what we see as a manifested existence is the same. This is the great, great revelation. The Upanishad not only deals with the transcendent, but deals with the imminent, and thirdly, finds that they are actually one and the same. And then, in the section we were dealing with last time, we have this beautiful analogy of the body as a city, a divine city, no doubt, belonging to one who is not born at all, and whose consciousness is unflickering, giving us another image, so that whenever we encounter some person, we can bring this image out and we can also sit and meditate on it. What is this body? It is an 11 gated city and the final gateway is a royal entrance or exit. That is the Uttara. Uh, this is the final exit of the, uh, the, great, the great royal entry entrance of the city. This is the one which we don't normally use. And so this gives us two types of freedom, ultimately. This passage mentions or infers that there is a possibility of us being free in this life by controlling these gates. And once we are free, we'll automatically control these gates to our city anyway. That being there, that realize, realization of this entity that is inherently within us is a controlling factor. And then what happens when the body falls off or the city goes? Then videha mukta, mukti is there. That is freedom in a post-mortem condition. That is a realization of our continuous existence, our continuous freedom. It's not that we gain freedom. We were always free. We didn't realize it. We thought we were bound. We have the instinct that we are bound only because we thought we were the city. We thought we were the body. And so, just so we don't make any misunderstanding, a small boy yesterday asked a very astute question, hearing about this Atman from his mother or from his parents, said, so, if I reach inside, will I catch it? Or, you know, what does it look like inside? These kinds of questions are there. And they're not immature questions. They're, these are questions from mature minds also. So in case you think that it is entrapped in any way, that it is caged in any way, that it needs to be released and freed, that it is a prisoner, 
the Katu Upanishad is very, very clear and gives us then an idea that is really taken from the Hamsavati mantra. The seer is Vam Deva, and it's a prayer to the sun who illumines the world and dispels the darkness of people. This Hamsa is seen to be a swan, naturally, literally, but it's seen to be just uh, reminiscent and symbolic of that which gives light and that which gives life, that which travels across the sky seemingly like a great chariot and illumines the whole world, dispels the darkness of people. So there's again analogy is used, symbolism is used, but the meaning is no, this entity is found everywhere. Once you find it in yourself, you'll also find it everywhere. So we find all these various themes and we may as well continue about the logic of these themes. So we go from the parable of the chariot, from the rise awake, this revealing the internal possibility and the possibility that we not only manifest our full potential everywhere, but we see the manifested existence as simply that, it's a manifested version of this transcendent entity. What do we mean by uh, immanence and transcendence? I think I gave you an example previously. I can give it to you again by way of a story. Naturally, if it's a story, I suppose I have to say once upon a time, you see there were elements of glass. We can say glass or glass incorporated. And these glasses came together because they realized that together, when they come together, something like a glass pane, they see that the sun, when it beams, radiates through the glass. And being an incorporation, they want to earn some money. And they find it's very unfair that the glass has a free passage through them. All the rays of the sun travel freely through the pane of glass. And so they have a conference, something like a board meeting, and they decide we should actually charge some visa fees. And if the sun doesn't agree, then we'll block him. We'll put a sanction on the sun. And not only the sanctions, but we'll put a barrier. We'll together cooperate. We'll tell the sun, please don't come through here anymore unless you have a paid visa. And if you attempt to do it, then we will block you and prevent you. We'll make us something like a Ukrainian-Russian war. All right. So they passed the resolution and relayed the message to the sun, but the sun didn't care. The sun still shone through, and the shards of grass jostled together and shattered themselves. Instead of being a single pane, they destroyed themselves, and still the sun shone. When the sun shone through the glass, it was called immanence. And when the glass itself was destroyed and the sun still shone, this was called transcendence. Nothing really happened. Only the local conditions changed. The sun shining through, still shone, and the shards of glass destroying themselves. Even so, the sun still shone. So it is how we view the world that creates what we call imminence and transcendence. It is not that there was any change in the essential entity. And so the eternal Lord abides within the cave of the heart, described here as the size of a thumb, something like the dwarf that challenged and actually rules the entire world. And then, supposing then the city goes away and we haven't realized, we haven't got this idea not even in this life of Jivan Mukti, nor in the post-condition when the city is gone, we still didn't discover 
the nature of our own freedom. What then? This Upanishad, and we haven't come to the section that describes a process of rebirth. Because rebirth is simply that if you impose a condition, the condition is temporal based, spatially based, and also causally based. You can't get away from this causal law. The causal law, of course, we call karma, a much in misunderstood concept. And so what happens has to be described. There's a logical sequence of it. And then, as I mentioned, the question of the self being imminent and transcendent is being discussed. And finally, we come to a concept that we still find also in the Bhagavad Gita. And that is that the world tree, or how will you describe this world of experience, this manifested version of it, you'll describe it as something like a tree. But the tree is rooted in this self. And by now we understand the interchangeability of terms, Atman self, Brahman, these are synonymous terms, interchangeable. And this world tree, when you describe it in these universal terms, you also have to use this term Brahman. This world tree is rooted in Brahman. How does this tree operate? How does this world operate? Well, the causal presence of this Brahman makes sure that the wind blows, makes sure that things operate, makes sure that gravitational energy does its job, makes sure that electrical energy does its job. And so this is called, in language, which anybody can recognize, human language as the great fear. And then, of course, there's the perception of the self. But then, finally, a wonderful question arises. How is this now to be known? Having described what it is, how is it to be known? And then what is the need of this knowledge? What practical use is it? And that is discussed finally. So you can see there's a logical unfolding of this truth, of the mysteries of life, of the very important questions that are discussed, not the trivial questions. So this is a background to this Katupanishad and its importance and its significance. And when we read it and when we study it, we see how beautifully it's put in simple language that anybody can really understand. But where is the complexity? The complexity is in the unfamiliarity of the concepts. Unfamiliar because we work and live and walk in a world which is egocentric and geocentric. And to get away from it is difficult. When the world is egocentric, it means the world is body-centric. And when the world is geocentric, it is the environment centered. And we find it difficult to even to get away from the language of things. If you look into the night sky, we have a habit of saying up. We have a habit of saying down. But when we get out of the Earth's environment, we find this up and down has no meaning. The great cosmological principle will state that things are homogenous everywhere, isometric everywhere. Or it seems to be like that. It's assumed to be like that. Modern discovery is throwing cold water on that uh, now probably well-worn theory because we find that way, way out. It is not like that. It is a little clumpy. Anyway, that aside, the idea really is that we are not the center of the entire universe no matter how much we think we are. But when we try to measure it or make sense of it, yes, for practical purposes, we can put it that way. And for passport purposes, we can issue our egocentric position, but it has no more practical value. Indeed, if we stick to this position, we come to grief. Because the central difficulty that we have is the difficulty of pain, suffering, and how to deal with various vicissitudes of life. And so this is not just theoretical philosophy. It is not just coming up with a hypothesis. It is coming up with something that is a rational position, but also something that is to do with your experiential 
experience. How do you experience life in reality at the greatest depth, not on the surface? So in the uh, Satipatthaya Brahmana, Trayun Agni, for example, is described. It's identified with the sun and with the air. And so we have to take this on board, all these ancient references, when we deal with the various stanzas. As the moving sun, he lives in the heavens. He pervades all and dwells in the interspace. And as fire, we have to take this as Agni Brahman. He resides on the earth. And as Soma, which we also take as Brahman, he stays in a jar. And so we are using the ancient ritualistic concepts and universalizing these, bringing a new meaning. He lives among men. Yes, he lives in men and he lives among men. He lives among the deities, among the senses, but also deities meaning the fundamental expressive waves that are manifested as this universe. In order to understand this, we also have to understand how we go backwards to discover this internal entity, how we go into more generalized, more subtle, more vast, more truthful areas. And that is really the process. Collectively, it is called the process of discrimination, viveka, looking at things more closely, more analytically, and experiencing it, going back, as it were, in meditation. Last week, weekend, we were busy in the meditation workshop. And there, from different points of view, it was described how the meditation process is a devolutionary process. Evolution being the unfolding of what was there. Devolution meaning folding it back up again until we get to the source. Making sure that we understand the subject and the object merge to become the same thing. And at that point, we call this dhyana, meditation. When one single idea is present, we call this meditation. But the process going backwards, we can also call the process of meditation as well. And so, just to refresh your memory, the language expressed as, in a pictorial way, familiar to those people who first understood this or studied this, but also familiar to us once we know these ancient concepts and put them in pictorial graphic forms. It requires a poetic mind. That's the point. We can say the sun shines. Maybe it's to do with fusion. Maybe it's to do with thermodynamic laws. Whatever it is, we can describe the sun as basically hydrogen converting itself into helium after a long time expressing itself through convection and what have you and then shining and we feel the warmth of it and we understand that life is there because of it but when you delve into further the question comes about what is that entity that lights the sun itself that makes these things actively involved and then to rally around our poetic creative side why don't we actually think that the sun is the same entity being lit from within that travels across the sun like a chariot and that we greet again tomorrow something like a cosmic swan floating but with the central understanding and the main understanding that the supreme energy that we may call all these different forms is exactly identified with this entity called Brahman and the same Brahman in ourselves is called Atman, the very self, Brahman or Atman. And so any verse that entertains these poetic ideas really affirms only one thing, that the whole universe is not different from the Supreme Brahman. And we can bring this into our practical life and questioning. When will we realize this highest? I haven't time for spiritual life because 
I'm engaged so much in my activities, in working sometimes 16 hours a day for you know, entrepreneurs, no time for family life and so on. These are the practical complaints that many people have. Well, you made an error. You drew a line between spirituality and the deeper things of life and this regular working, waking existence. What right did you have to do that? What foundation is there to justify it? Like a line on the water is Ramakrishna's description. You put a line on the water, it looks like a line, it looks like a separation, soon it'll disappear, it's not really there. So we have to get used to this, even Ramanuja will state, itat sarvam aparichina satya rupa brahmatmakam, that actually the whole universe is not really different from the Supreme Brahman. Udram pranam unyayatya apanam pratyag ashuti ashuti badye vamanam ashinam vishve deva upasati. You see, we think that life is to do with breath. If you observe somebody in the process of dying and you ask, what is life? It's a great question. Even the great Schrodinger gave a series of questions around, a series of talks, I should say, around this question, what is life? And it has become a kind of standard textbook for many people, and many scientific discoveries are hinted at, including his own statement that consciousness can only be one, it can never be many. At least he makes that statement. But when you ask this question, what is life? There are whole conferences now on this question. What is life? And it brings up this whole aspect of what is consciousness. But still, people give their, all their various opinions, give their various understandings of it, their various hypotheses about it, from their various paradigms and positions. But you see, this question um, arises in us. One thing we do understand that life is something like a breath. The ancient Jewish expression of it is ruach, in a cosmological sense, that that entity that God breathed, uh, breathed across the waters of life. The beautiful poetic description of it. But some people take the breath aspect and forget about the supreme aspect that does the breathing. And so it's quite clear that life is not independent, independently inserted and withdrawn from us, simply a phenomena, inexplicable. And so this passage will tell us that the breath, it doesn't operate independently and can be identified in different sections. See, originally this term prana actually meant breath. It was used for the supreme being and in the early Upanishads, we can see it described as some vital powers to do with speech, to do with breath, the eye, the ear, and so on. We now have this mentioned in a different context. The different context is in terms of deities, devas. We worship devas, that is expressions and different powers. And these can come out as breaths as well. One is seated in the middle, and that one who's seated in the middle, coming to the same kind of uh, illustration or same kind of creative picture of, an, of a subtle idea, that entity seated in the middle, we can imagine, we can use this in a meditation, it pushes. The, the prana, that is the vital force, the energy that moves the diaphragm, it pushes upward. In this same way also, it impels the opposite apana downwards. And this is coming now to great yogic ideas of parts of this 
prana, this energy, distributed in different sections. Now, what we know just from our philosophy, from our philosophical or logical process, that anything that has divisions and anything that can be divided and anything that has parts and anything that works together in cooperation is definitely independent of some owner. So some entity is there directing it, leading it. And what is that entity? It is the same principle, the same Atman, the same Prana, the same, uh, um, sorry, the same Atman, the same Brahman within us. So we can see that they stand for breaths. We can easily see how it stands for expiration, inspiration. We breathe in, we breathe out. Something is pushing. Those people who study the yoga will know how to control that and even suspend the breath. Voluntarily they can do it. But normally speaking, it's an involuntary process. The fact that somebody can take charge of this breathing and decide how many breaths to take in, how to control the diaphragm muscle at will, how to expand the lungs. You know, yogic breathing, there's such a thing as complete breath. And we understand the mechanism is there where we can fill the lower lungs, we can fill the middle part of the lungs, we can fill the upper part of the lungs. Most people in a state of anxiety are doing shallow breathing, only operating the upper portion of the lungs. But when you see somebody in sleep, you'll see that they are using the lower portion of the lungs. And when we now simulate that, everything becomes calmer. And it's interesting that modern physiology and psychology also have used this. If you suffer from panic, why don't you practice slow, rhythmic breathing? Patanjali in the Patanjali Yoga Sutras takes the subject up. If you want to control through lack of concentration, lack of concentration means the normal energy that we used is scattered all over the place, giving us a sense of, in its extreme, panic, grief, irregular breathing, shaking. All these are symptoms of lack of concentration. So how will we regulate it? Naturally, we use the counterpoint of it. Why don't you embrace regular breathing? Why don't you calm the mind? And it comes back to, why don't you employ a concentrated way of thinking, a more rhythmic, regular way of thinking? As soon as you do that, the breath itself becomes regulated. Just further to that, one of the processes in the Eightfold System of Meditation and its process, the one aspect will be called pranayama. That is the control of this prana, misunderstood as control of breath. No, it's not that. It's control of the energy that enables the movement of the lungs. Swami Vivekananda uses the example of a flywheel in controlling this, telling us that if we are able to control this, we can control all the other subtle movements. All right. But there's an alternative that is suggested. Love of God is suggested. Meditation itself is suggested. Having a different way of thinking is suggested. A different way of acting is suggested. You'll notice I'm incorporating all of those systems that we call yogas. In this way, we control the prana also. When you control psychic prana, control your thought, you'll find you have automatically controlled your breathing and therefore your nervous system has become regulated. And so these, we can say these uh, semi-administrators, these minor administrators used in the language that we can say are devas or illuminating factors, we can recognize these as manifestations also of this one central entity. And so, worthy to be served, vananiyam sambha janiyam, says Shankaracharya, that these entities, Vishve, Deva, are all considered to be literally all the deities. 
So Shankaracharya's interpretation, along with ours, really makes much more sense. These are not external entities. These are actually within us anyway. These are the sense organs. These are the vital powers and which are subject to the person within. And who is that person within? It is the Lord whom they are worshipping by their uninterrupted activity. Let's just consider the meditative value of this. It is a beautiful, beautiful concept. Why is breath taking place? Why are cells being re repaired? Why is the so-called normal physical activity taking place that we normally take for granted? When we understand the complexity going on and the various concepts around the central concept of a city operating with small administrators going on that we may call devas. These are the sense organs and we can't divorce them from the mind. They are part and parcel of it. All of them are doing this, not just, just to function, merely function, but they're doing it out of worship. What a beautiful concept this is. They're doing it in order to honor the central Lord of the universe who sits within, and because of his presence, they are performing these functions as a worship. What a beautiful, beautiful concept, and what a beautiful theme for meditation we can use. Asyam vishram samanasya shariya yastasya dehinaha dehad vimocha manasya kim atra palishishyate and then the normal statement we end up are now used for used to itadvaitat. This is that. So when the embodied self or seemingly embodied self that dwells within the body slips off and is released from the body, the question then remains, what is there? What remains after all of that? And the answer comes anyway, this is that. Tadvaitat. It's a very central question. What remains? So what remains is the universal soul. What remains is that Brahman. That's all that remains. So this is a very profound answer to the central question. It's like asking, you see, when a broadcasting company broadcasting a radio broadcast. When that broadcasting station continues, then what happens to it when the transistor dies or gets turned off? See, it's a meaningless question. It continues. What happens to the sun when the shards of glass destroy themselves? It continues. It has no effect. We can't ask what happens when my radio gets turned off or when my transistor dies out or when it goes in for repair. What happens to the broadcasting company and when will it reincarnate? The question of reincarnation doesn't arise. The question of incarnation doesn't arise. The sun shines, that's all. We can't ask when will it be born again? What is its karma? So that shift in thinking is this profound conclusion of the Upanishads. And we may talk about birth and rebirth and so on and so forth. But you see, when you shift your perspective to the universal, these questions don't even arise. Still, we have to maybe deal with the understanding of what if I identify myself with the receiver, that is the transistor, if given the example of radio broadcast. And so we have to deal with this. But the verse I have just read out really repudiates actually the materialist doctrine that we have come to, <laughs> come to know and be familiar with, even within ourselves, that the soul is just an assemblage of parts. 
you know, there was a, some experiment given, or we have found the weight of the soul. We did a weight before a person or when a person was dying, and then we weighed the person when he, that person was a corpse. And then we found out what is the weight difference, the difference in mass, that's the weight of the soul. These kind of concepts are a little childish, to be honest. And so the material understanding is, oh, the soul is just an assemblage of parts. It is just a life force that comes and goes, and there's no more to that. It's just part of matter. Well, that makes out, of course, that just as a house and the dweller are separate, the destruction of the house doesn't mean the destruction of the dweller. That understanding has to be inculcated. And so just like the body is a housing, the loss of the body doesn't mean the dissolution of the soul, the Lord, the prime mover, the entity that stands there and sits there. It doesn't go anywhere, no coming or going in it. The loss of the body doesn't mean the dissolution of the soul. And while desertion of the body by the soul would mean the disintegration of the body, that's all. So what about this concept of rebirth? Let us take this up. The sixth stanza takes it up like this. Hantata idam pravakshami guhyam brahma sanatanam yatacha maranam prapya atma bhavate gotama. Look, that is here. I shall explain to you, says Yama, the mystery of Brahman. Why should Brahman be a mystery? Because we don't relate to it, normally speaking. The eternal, it doesn't die. It's not subject to any time constraints. And also how that soul, in this case, this accumulation of experience that identifies itself with all the instrumentation that we have, body and mind, after reaching death, when we assume that we are this body-mind complex and the body-mind goes, is that the end? No, because there is still that existing entity, which we may say is accumulated experiences. This is described in the Taitiri Upanishad in the language of sheaths or koshas. And when the one kosha made that is just made from food, what happens? We know that the central entity doesn't go anywhere. That we know. But when it's still identified and therefore not free or experiencing its own freedom, then what? All right, from that point of view, let's take it up. You see somebody who is suffering from grief because a person has supposedly died and that means the body has gone. The question is always, where has that person go, go to? Where has it gone to? And really, it's the same question when a sleeping person is there. Bhrataranyaka Upanishad puts this up. The teacher sees, says, look at this person. This person is sleeping. I'll shout in his ear. Nothing. I'll whisper a secret. Nothing. Well, where has this person gone to? That's the question. It's the same question. Where has this person gone to? The beautiful description from Ramakrishna, I've just gone to the next room. So from this point of view, what happens? So the answer comes like this. I shall explain to you this mystery and also how the soul fares after reaching death. I shall tell you that secret. So it's a secret of not oh, two things. It's a secret of the eternal Brahman that never goes anywhere. And also, how this self fares after death, we know it doesn't go anywhere. But some souls, that is, soul as opposed to spirit. Now we have to make this distinction, because there's a huge confusion about it. Even amongst Hindus familiar with the term jiva and atman, they say, they confuse these terms. Is the atman jiva? Is the jiva atman? No. When the atman, the atman unencumbered with anything, not covered up. When the Atman is there and remains there, it's called Atman. But when it is associated with all the cumulative experiences, 
that go through the manifested conditioned aspect, then we call this jiva, soul. Jiva means something that is alive, something is living, something that is distinct from other jivas. All right, what becomes of that is the question. We can call this the lower self and the higher self, and the lower self is this higher self in association, that's all. It is this higher self that gives the life, that lends things, that makes things look animated. And when we see the animated thing, we call this soul or jiva. Well, some souls enter the womb for acquiring bodies. And others follow the motionless in accordance with their work and in conformity with their knowledge. So therefore, it is the experience, it is the causal law that comes in to play. So the law of karma that we are born to our deeds, this is assumed. Shankaracharya puts it like that, exactly as I have said it. Yatashrutam yadrasham cha vijnanam uparjitam tad anurapam eva shariram pratipadyanti iti. The law of karma, which is to do with sowing and reaping, to do with our knowledge and experience, brings us forward. That person who is awake in those that sleep, shaping desire after desire, that indeed is the pure. Now we have to bring in the simulation of death that occurs every night. That is Brahman. That indeed is called the immortal. In it all the worlds rest and no one ever goes beyond it. And then tadivat. Etadvaitat, this truly is that. So, ya esha supteshu jagarti kamam kamam purusho nirmim manaha tadeva shukram tad brahma tad evam ratam uchati tasmin loka sritaha sarve tad u ne tieti kash chana etadvaitat. Then the next th thing is, it speaks, this Upanishad speaks of the secret Brahman about which it was promised, I shall tell. This so now we come to the other section. What about the Brahman? What about the actual self? Not the apparent self. That's a good language to use. The apparent self and there is the actual self. The actual self we can call Brahman. But we can also call it by different names. Atman, we've also described. But it is essential, the quintessential aspect of the person. And Sanskrit for person is Purusha. So the Purusha, who keeps awake and goes on creating desirable things, even in dream. And when the senses fall asleep, that is still pure. That is Brahman, the one that witnesses it and also expresses it. And he is called the immortal. And all the worlds are fixed on him, not just your personal worlds of waking, dream, and dream of sleep, but all the worlds, all the cosmos, the whole of the universal experience. These are fixed on him. And actually, none can transcend him. That's it. That's the final transcendence. And this is that. These themes are said over and over again, repeatedly, to get us out of our misunderstanding. When things are explained well, we can understand intellectually. But then when somebody hits us left, right, and center, we lose our, all our understanding and we get angry. So how to sustain this knowledge? It is only real knowledge when it is consistent, when it is our primary and secondary nature, when it is our absolute reflex from that position. So since the knowledge of the unity of the self, though it's validated by proof and reiterated more than once, says the commentator, does not find a lodging in the hearts of those, even those of the highest status, those brahmanas of insincere intellect, whose minds are swayed by intellectual understandings, 
We have so many of them. Intellectual gymnastics to do with doctrines, dogmas, what we call theology. And then intellectual maneuverings to do with philosophical speculations. Instead of finding out what is the actual truth through experience, the only experience valid is direct experience. That is the only proof. And so you can say that they are swayed by the intellect of numerous logicians, and therefore the Upanishad, being eager to inculcate it, tells us again and again and again the same thing. And so it says, just as fire, though one, having entered the world, assumes separate forms in respect of different shapes, fire, light, luminosity, the sun, lightning, the fire of the hearth, the spark of electricity, we can say in modern times. All different aspects and different forms and different shapes and the corresponding eyes that catch it because the sun and the eye are used as representative terms for things which are seen, for photons, basically. Similarly, the self inside all beings, though one, assumes a form in respect of each shape, yet it is outside. We can't divorce the shapes from that self. We can't say, I'm looking for the self, and I'll then divorce it from everything else. That is not really discrimination. Discrimination incorporates everything also. So it is both inside, it is both outside, it assumes this is what we call this immanence and this transcendence. As fire is one, entering the world becomes varied in shape. Agnya yataito bhuvanam pravishtam rupam rupam pratirupam bhava. Ekashtata sarva bhutanta atma rupam rupam pratirupa bahischa. So, as I say, as fire, which is one entering this world, becomes varied in shape according to the object it burns. It simply takes the shape, or water takes the shape of the vessel, even. So, also that one self within all beings becomes varied, or seems to become varied, really. See the awkwardness of our language, according to whatever it enters. And also, of course, it exists outside it all. So, there's an example I gave a small child yesterday. I took a cup and I turned it upside down. I said, what's inside the cup? He was astute enough to say, air. Yes. What's outside the cup? Air. Is air exclusively inside and outside? No. And when I take the cup off and look inside, what is there? Air. What was there? Air. So it's a good example. It's both inside and outside. When I see it inside and don't see it outside, I say inside, and when I see it outside and there's no cup whatsoever, there's no mention of inside or outside. The terms don't apply. So the Rig Veda, in connection with this, where Indra in his conflict with the demons, which is an ongoing conflict taken in mythology, is said to have assumed many forms through his magic powers, becoming the counterform of every form. That is the idea. And so, rupam, rupam, prati, rupam, uh, babuva, indro, mayabhi, pururupa, irati, both inside and outside. While the self assumes many forms, it's yet outside the manifested world in its own unmodified nature. Svena, avikritena, rupena, akashavat. That's what Shankaracharya is telling us. And so, the verse teaches us these wonderful concepts that I've mentioned, also giving you the example of the sheet of glass that ineffectively tried to stop the sun from shining. Then the idea of air comes up, the example I've given, as air, which is one entering the world, becomes varied in shape according to the object it enters. So also the one self within all beings becomes varied according to whatever it enters and also exists outside them all. 
Why not use one example? Why so many examples are used? See, as air through one having tamed, and so on and so forth. By using all these similes of fire, of air, the teacher here, in this case Yama, tries to show Nachiketa the subtle quality of the great self, who although one in form is like air and fire, yet assumes different shapes according to the form that it, in which it dwells. It is only by this repetition and these various examples that we catch some kind of glimpse of it, some kind of rudimentary understanding. And then how do we make it more real to us? Through the process of meditation, the process of really con connecting with the idea so that it becomes a living reality for us. And so there's this, all this meditative aspect is provided by these multiple examples. And then another example, just as the sun then, the eye of the whole world is not defiled by the external faults seen by the eye. Even so, the one within all beings is not tainted by the sorrow of the world. He is outside the world. If the world decides to explode itself through a nuclear war, you can't ask why the sun was responsible for this. You find a typical theological question, so much misery in the world, why did God make such a miserable world? And why is he such a ruthless God to make it? And why doesn't he help me? See, these are immature questions, a wrong understanding of these things. And so the text goes on. And I'll finish off soon on this, just, just as the sun and so on is transcendent and so on. You can't blame anything else. And then eternal peace is for those and not for others who are using this kind of discrimination and who realize in their hearts him who being one, the controller and the inner self of all makes a single form multifarious. So this is now approaching section three where we come to a conclusion. We'll come to this conclusion next week. So the one eternal admit the transient, the conscious admit the conscious, the one admit the many who grants their desires to the wise who perceive him as abiding, abiding in the soul. To them is eternal peace and to no others. What is the utility of all of this? Don't you want eternal peace? May most people say yes. So don't you want eternal consistency, contentment, happiness, and peace? Most people will answer yes, and that becomes the utility of all of this. We'll leave it off for there. We'll pick it up then next week. We'll take it really from the 12th stanza, which is the one I just mentioned. And then we'll see where that takes us. The other sections is will lead us eventually to the final part for the, the actual second part, the third section of it. And we use the example of this great cosmic tree, a wonderful description and that section actually will go on to ask us the final question about what is the final utility of this. And so the theme draws to its logical conclusions with that and actually concludes with the original prayer that we started off with. That becomes the final concluding prayer of the Kato Upanishad when we finish off. And just to remind you what that is, may that one protect us both. May that one nourish us both or nourish our knowledge. May that one, may we attain energy and vigor together, all, all together. And may our study be invigorated, all of those things which are there. And so I hope that you have found some utility also in this section. It's quite difficult to go with the study of the Kattu Upanishad and then leave it off as we have for several weeks. So it requires refreshing what is the theme, what is the progression of the themes and how useful it is to us. And some beautiful, beautiful, beautiful passages there, not only for our logical uh, um, sorting out of what is true, what is untrue, our own discrimination, but also our own meditation practice.
Om Shanti, Shanti, Shanti. Peace, peace, peace be unto all. Oh.